If you would, this morning, my name is Andy, I'm one of the pastors here this morning. I don't like the phrase, God has something fresh or something new up his sleeve, and maybe I'm wrong on this, but when that's said, I, 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 I guess I would think that, yes, it's fresh and new to us, but I don't think that God has created or invented anything new of him this morning. I think he's just ready to release, or, or we've come to a place where he's ready to release more of himself to us, and that's just new to us. So ironically, I love the way that God sets things up. So day four of the 42 days of reading that is in the Awe of God book, ironically, was today. And, and the, the moments that I've gone through it, day four has been the most impactful day of the 42 days. In fact, I, I think I've spent more time on day four because of a statement that I'm about to say to you that is John Bevere's statement, but I believe that it's true. And it's ironic, you know, I spend all week preparing and planning and praying and seeking the Lord for the message. And then right at the last hour, the Lord puts this phrase that I've heard several different times, and the day four is today. Like the Lord just kind of lined this up, and the passage that I'm about to read is specifically specifically the statement that I will, be, I will say to you in just a few moments. So Luke chapter 10, verse 38, if you want to turn there in your Bibles or your biblical devices. In our reading this morning, we began to learn about the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God. And we know that the omnipresence of God means that God is everywhere. He created the universe. He created the earth. He is here today, whether we like it or not. He's just here. The manifest presence of God is when God decides to show up and freshen you, touch you, heal you, reveal to you through his word. In fact, in John chapter 14, I believe it's verse 21, he says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. So the omnipresence of God means that God shows up. And I I think if you remember, I've done an illustration of this before. But say that we had a billionaire in our midst. And he showed up every Sunday morning and he was with us and we all knew him. Likeable guy. He wasn't prideful or this or that because of his riches. But we knew sitting right in the middle of the room with us every week is a billionaire. Well, this one Sunday, this billionaire decides to show up and feel, and he decides to bless us each with $1,000. So he goes around person to person to person to person and physically gives you $1,000. He has now manifested. His riches are always among us, but he has now manifested his riches physically by giving you a portion of that. And that's what it means when God manifests his presence. It could be in... Like Jesus said in John chapter 14, it may be him manifesting himself through his word and revealing to you something that's new and fresh to you. Trust me, I don't believe it's new and fresh to God because he's always desired you to have it and it's always been him. You're just at a level of maturity and you're seeking him and desiring him enough that he's willing or your reverence of him has grown to where, okay, now you can handle what I'm willing to manifest to you. There's the manifestational touch of healing. There's the manifestational touch of the fruits of the Spirit. There's the manifestational touch of speaking in tongues. There's there's different ways that the Lord, we see in the Bible, that God manifests his presence and makes himself known to his people. And I believe that happens in accordance to the reverence of his people. So the statement in the reading today is that God will not manifest his presence in a place where he is not revered. God's manifest presence will not manifest itself in a place that he is not revered. So Luke chapter 10, verse 38 begins, and we all, most of us know the story. I think I've preached on it several times in the past five years, and wasn't quite sure why the Lord decided to take me back to it this week, but here we are. 
It said, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? I think all of us would have some type of feeling inside of us, some type of animosity inside of us if we were Martha in the moment. I can resonate with Martha. I don't want to be too hard on Martha in this story. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, saying her name twice, saying her name twice is important. You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. And that good portion will not be taken away from her. We have to notice the fact of positioning in this story. We notice that Mary is positioned at Jesus' feet. And one of the things that I felt like as we were worshiping this morning is that as a pastor, the most important thing to me is the word. The most important thing to me is that you're taught the word. But even more important to me is that you or we respond to the word. And so as a pastor, sometimes I can be a Martha and I can get caught up in the way we do church, making sure that everything is set up right, making sure that the light is right, which by the way, we had a lot of fun with the crystal ball this morning. We put the lights on it, we tried to get it to rotate to see if it would create a holy atmosphere and we decided it wouldn't, but there it hangs anyway. I can be a Martha And I can lean into my Martha side very quickly. And I think many will resonate with that. Because it's interesting, as I read this story for the first time in a long time, the Lord pointed out the fact that what was Martha doing? Martha was working, she was preparing, she was serving who? Jesus. What she was doing was for Jesus. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all wrong with that. And I don't think Jesus necessarily was rebuking the doing. I think what he was rebuking was the anxiousness. What he was rebuking was the feeling or the animosity or the pride that welled up in her because she was doing all of this for Jesus. But yet Jesus comes and says, you're missing it. You're missing it. Mary was positioned at Jesus' feet. And she wasn't worried or anxious about anything but hearing what Jesus had to say and what Jesus was teaching. And thus, Mary wasn't missing what Jesus had for her. In fact, Jesus, dare to say, was manifesting himself unto Mary at the moment. And Martha, because of her doing for Jesus, was missing the manifestation of what Jesus had in this moment. And that's what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about this holy revelation that he was imparting on the people that were willing to listen and the people that were willing to hear. And he was rebuking the distraction. In this day and age, I could go deep into the culture and I could go deep into the teaching. What Martha was doing was culturally correct. Because when you invite somebody When you invited somebody into your home, especially a man as a woman, it was dependent upon you to make sure that experience relationally and physically, making sure that experience was correct and that the person you were hosting, your guest, was experiencing a great atmosphere. And what Jesus was saying is, listen, Martha, you can try all you want, But the atmosphere is no longer about what you are trying to do. The atmosphere is about who I am. And what you're not allowing to happen here is me fill the atmosphere. It was a paradigm shift of saying that when Jesus walks into the room, he is the atmosphere. When Jesus walks into the room, he is, his presence is the most important presence in the room and we can do everything and we can we can create space and we can create environments and we do that every Sunday morning I was here at seven along with the setup team this morning 
to get things ready and prepared. And I think all of that is good until the anxiousness or until the anxiety or until the animosity begins to creep inside because it's not necessarily right or it's not the correct, correct environment or maybe the lights flashed in my eyes or maybe the song choices weren't quite right. And what Jesus is saying is the most important presence in this room isn't the lights being on or off, isn't the screens working well enough. You may not know this, but this screen over here was just a bit crooked this morning, so I didn't look at it. I'm the one that set up the projector, so it's on me anyway. But what Jesus is saying is, as you walked in this room this morning, was he the most important? factor of you being here this morning? Was he the most important factor of you being here this morning? Was he what we allowed to fill the environment? To was he allowed to create the space that he desired and he wants to manifest himself to us this morning? I've been learning a lot about the reverence of God lately, what it means to revere the Lord, and how as the reverence inside of my heart and soul grows for the Lord. You've heard me say over and over the past few weeks that the most important thought that man can think is what he thinks when he thinks about God, what he thinks when he thinks of God. And it's been interesting to watch. I told this to the men on Wednesday night that as we entered the book, one of the things that you have to allow yourself to be as you go through this book is offended. You have to allow God to offend you because as you read through the book or as you read through the word, there are some words that just simply offend your flesh. And, and the Lord is meaning to do that so that you take notice of those things and he can begin to work in, in you to change those things. To create a better image of himself in you so that you begin, that you continue to grow and mirror who he is. Who he is. Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. He was welcome. He was welcome. He, she welcomed him into her house. But then she wanted it done her way. She welcomed Jesus. She sat him down. She served Jesus. But she didn't want it Jesus' way. She wanted it her way. And she wanted to dictate to Jesus how the day and how the evening should go. And Jesus was saying, I'm showed up. I'm here. I'm going to dictate how things should go. And that's exactly what he just said to me as we were worshiping over there. So real quickly this morning, Martha was distracted and Jesus rebukes the distraction that the things were causing. So I'd ask you this morning to identify and eliminate the distractions. This is where the offense, to, this is where you allowing the Lord to offend you this morning and show you the areas that you might be being a Martha and allowing the word, the, the, the spirit of of Jesus to manifest himself in your heart to where he can reveal and help you identify and eliminate distractions. Luke, 4, Luke 10, 40 said, but Martha was distracted with much serving. In Hebrews 12, it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off anything or everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In Luke 13, we see the parable of the soils. I believe the American church is stuck right smack dab in the middle of the thorny soil. Because Jesus, 
Jesus taught that as you get stuck in the thorny soil, the seed that fell on the thorny soil was a seed that grew and accepted Jesus, but as the thorns grew up, it distracted them. They were distracted by all the things around them and by the wealth that they were blessed with. And Paul encourages, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off anything that hinders. So identify and eliminate anything that might be hindering the Lord from manifesting himself more fully in you this morning. Second, some of you in here are doers. And I don't want to rebuke you for that doing because I think the doing is necessary. I think it's the anxiousness and the anxiety and the animosity that comes along with the doing. So second, I believe we need to prioritize the necessary. In verse 41 and 42, the Lord answers her and says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. Mary made a choice that evening. And we could go into the culture and how she defied culture by going in and sitting with the men because a woman shouldn't have been sitting with the men listening to the teacher teach, but yet she defied culture. She defied culture by going in and sitting right at Jesus' feet. And she didn't sit at the back of the room where she wouldn't be noticed. She sat right at Jesus' feet defying culture. And finally... This is going to sound weird at first. I believe we need to stop scrounging for crumbs and pull up to the table. Psalm 107 verse 9 says, For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. In Psalm 23, the passage of the Good Shepherd, he says, You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. In a distracted culture, we can quickly become okay with just the crumbs that fall from his banquet table instead of pulling up to his banquet table. Stop scrounging for crumbs and pull up to the table. That's what the book reading is about as far as I'm concerned. It's about recultivating a pulling up to the table for 42 days straight. Because they say it takes about six weeks to form a new habit. And if we don't have the habit of pulling up to the table daily, then all we're doing is scrounging for scraps. And maybe for some that's okay, but I'm quickly becoming more aware of the fact that he satisfies the longing soul. Psalm 107, I'm going to personalize this a little bit more. For he satisfies my soul when it longs, and fills me when I am hungry with goodness. For he satisfies your soul when you long for him, and fills your soul with goodness when it is hungry for him. And I think a lot of this comes with desire. I think we need to desire that one thing. In Psalm 27, the Lord is my, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked come against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. You imagine what this verse is saying to the Jews in Israel right now? You imagine sitting under the blanket of what happened yesterday in Israel, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall, set my, he shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy 
in his temple. I will sing yes. I will sing praises to the Lord. Could you imagine if you were a Messianic Jewish Christian in Israel today reading those passages? Lisa Chan, wife of Francis Chan, says this. As the world careens in on all its frenetic madness and many demands insist on our attention, we can become people who choose to be still, sit at the Lord's feet, and listen to his voice. For it is in his word that we will, we will receive the good portion we need the most. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Worship team, if you would come on back up. I believe the Lord wants us to give, an op give us an opportunity just to sit at his feet for a little bit this morning in worship. So you've heard me ask that we would just simply do the worship set again. You know, one of them, <laughs> it's funny how the Lord interrupts you or gives you a picture right in the moment. You know, this morning, I have to admit, I only heard half of Victor's call to worship because I was distracted in the back. In fact, I uh, was shushed by somebody. Thank you, Pam, for that rebuke. I love you. But then as I turned my attention, and this isn't a rebuke, this is just an observation, I looked around the room and some were engaged, and then others across the back were distracted. And for some of you, you didn't hear his call to worship at all. But what I did hear, the Lord said, don't you wish you would have heard all of it? Because I believe he did a good job of, of cultivating an atmosphere of worship in the room this morning. It's so easy to be distracted, isn't it, church? Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Would you stand with me this morning as we go back into worship? There's many, I think there's many postures of sitting at the Lord's feet. We can sit at his feet as he teaches us from his word. We can sit at his feet as somebody prays. We can sit at his feet in worship. I don't know what you have going on the rest of the day. But the most important thing you have today is the moment that we're about to experience. And I don't know what it's going to look like for you. I don't know even if you'll be able to access it. But I think the Lord has something for you. And I would invite you to move if that's what he says to do. The front is open up here. If you want to come and bow down or just get a little closer because it feels more intimate. There is something powerful, I believe, about movement and posture. There's something powerful about stepping forward and out of your comfort zone. There's something powerful about stepping and kneeling at the altar. this morning with your eyes closed what do you think of when you hear the word God he will manifest his presence upon you only if your heart reveres him 
So as we worship again this morning, I just invite the Holy Spirit to come as we kneel and as we spend time at your feet. I ask Jesus that you would manifest yourself in encouragement. Help us to identify and eliminate distractions. Help this to be more than just singing. But may we literally step into the Holy of Holies this morning because you've given us access through your Son, Jesus Christ. So we surrender our hearts to you and ask that you would have your way. Not our way. We don't want to do it our way this morning. We want you to do it your way. So send your Holy Spirit and allow us to surrender to it. In Jesus' name.